Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. And I'm Christopher Van Kaufman. And it's just the two of us uh, for the next few weeks. Uh, Christopher uh, and myself, uh, our, our partner uh, in this, uh, Joy Moore, is not able to be here. Uh, so we apologize for the uh, uh, lack of uh, gender diversity, and uh, we'll, we'll plow ahead. So uh, this is the podcast uh, for December 31st, 2023, the uh, the first Sunday of Christmas, uh, I think is the technical title. And it is Mark 1, 1 through 20. We now move to, and we will be um, continu continuously in the Gospel of Mark through Easter. Yeah, and this beginning of the Gospel of Mark will give us a good taste of what the narrative of Mark sounds like. And the first thing that you'll notice is it begins, unlike the other Gospels, we just got through the Christmas season, and the other Gospels, especially Luke is the most famous of the two in Luke 2, but then also Matthew 1, have infancy narratives. But in Mark 1, we don't get that. Instead, we begin with this prophecy from the prophet Isaiah. And it is, as Mark says, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. I always liked... Uh because Mark doesn't have either infancy narratives nor, uh, and it only has the one brief resurrection narrative, which uh, breaks off strangely. Mm -hmm. I was like th crazily the theory that uh, it was a folio and they lost the outer uh, leaf of the folio, thus losing the, the beginning and ending. I don't actually, I mean, that was somebody's theory once. <laughs> uh, it's actually very interesting though, because Mark in some ways is more like a lot of our ancient literature in that it begins in the middle of things and breaks off suddenly. Perhaps the best example of this is one of our very first pieces of literature, the Iliad, which is the story of the Trojan War, begins 10 years into the war and ends before the war ends. So you only get this kind of uh, glimpse of what's going on. It narrates part of it. And the same thing with the Gospel of Mark. It doesn't tell all of the story of the church, but it tells the important parts of Jesus's ministry. So that is an interesting uh, thing to consider as we start Mark in the narrative lectionary, is that it is not in the same way that Matthew and Luke are, this through narrative with a very clearly defined beginning and a very clearly defined end. So there's something interesting going on there. So uh, make a comment uh, we, before we started hitting record. Mark uh, starts off and uh, maybe he invents uh, a, new, a new genre of literature, the gospel, by saying, beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Son of God is uh, disputed whether that's in there, uh, although it makes sense to me that it is. Um, and then, then you kind of get it's actually it's like a mixed quotation. You get two different pieces of uh, Old Testament are cited. Yeah, Isaiah, and I believe it's the prophet Malachi as well. It is. And so we get kind of right from the beginning, a bridge between that which came before Jesus, the prophetic works, and then into, as you said, this perhaps a new genre. So this is one of the things that we'll talk about throughout our discussion of the Gospel of Mark, is there's a close link between the Gospel of Mark and the preaching of the Apostle Paul. And one of the things that we see there is the use of this word. So in English, it's translated as good news. And this is the Greek word euangelion, which means an announcement. It literally means good news. And Paul is the first person to use it in the singular like this. It's a little bit misleading because in English that sounds plural. We have to make news plural. But when he says the good news, he means the preaching about Jesus Christ. And Mark takes that and he means that as well. He also means the preaching about Jesus Christ, but it also becomes this genre of literature, this story of Jesus's ministry, trial, death, and resurrection. And we see this uh, clearly because we then have three other gospels in our canon, Matthew, Luke, and John. And there are also uh, these other gospels that are written. Um, you may have heard of some of them, like the gospel of Thomas and so forth. So it becomes a genre that people write in. Uh, but all building on this original use by Paul, meaning 
preaching about Jesus Christ. And it is the translation of um, this compound Greek word. Hebrew does not have any compound words, uh, unlike uh, Greek or English or most famously German, uh, <laughs> uh, where you can compound things endlessly and make new words. He Hebrew or Semitic languages do not have compound words. But what you get is in Isaiah 49, so a little bit after the the, the part uh, that's quoted here, um, you do get, um, get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. And the word that's translated good tidings and then Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, is a uh, it means a good news. That is, a, it's a positive. Um, uh, the message that uh, that the the messenger is arriving with is something positive, and especially, it's qualified here, as you just pointed out. Good news about Jesus Christ. So, and I want to point something else about about that first line. It's a really, and it sets the whole stage. Notice. Mark gives away the ending at the beginning. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Not Jesus, who knows who, but Jesus Christos, which is the Greek word for anointed. And tell us a little bit, Ralph, about how anointed, because this is also drawn out of the Old Testament. Yeah, well, I think so. Um, in the Old Testament and in Judaism, first century Judaism, uh, the, there was... It it came to the word the word Messiah in Hebrew, Christos translating it into Greek, came to be a title for um, one or two or three uh, figures who were expected to bring in the kingdom of God or to return the kingdom uh, to God's chosen people, and um, oversimplifying to the extreme, then the Messiah came to be uh, the royal figure. Um, more than just kings were anointed, but in the Old Testament, think about when David is anointed, especially this is connected to David. Samuel goes and he, he's sent to anoint one of Jesse's sons to be the new king, because Saul has been, uh, is gonna get replaced. And so the one he anoints is king. So therefore the Messiah, the, the descendant of David, the ideal perfect descendant of David, uh, who would be then the king of the people. So that's what this means. And of course, the great thing is now we're going to get, in verse one, we get Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah, and we don't hear about it again until chapter eight. And so the first chapter eight, there's a lot of, who is this guy? I mean, who is this guy? He he raises, uh, he teaches authority. Who is this guy? Even the storms obey him. And like you said, the reader knows, the reader, mm -hmm. we know who he is, but the characters in the story don't yet know yeah. who he is. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up the example of Samuel and David here, because there we see, of course, somebody who is anointed, David, God's chosen, God's chosen king. And we also have in the anointing role, the prophet Samuel. And that is a really interesting parallel of what we have going on, because the story, even though it's the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the first character we meet is not Jesus. It is John the baptizer who we meet in verse four and who's connected to this voice of one crying out in the wilderness. And we see him marked with, again, these uh, prophetic, first of all, prophetic clothing, and then also a prophetic message. Tell us a little bit about his clothing because he wears funny things. He wears a camel's hair, a leather belt around his waist. Yeah, well, especially these are associated with Elijah, especially uh, the camel hair coat. My dad used to have a a, a camel a camel hair sport coat, uh, so I, I like to see, think of John as uh, snappily dressed uh, in a camel. But it's odd, but it sets him off as Elijah. Elijah. Um, so Elijah is one of only two figures in the Old Testament who don't die but are taken directly to heaven, and so then. In the quotation, see, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way from Malachi. Malachi specifically, uh, by the way, the word Malachi means my messenger. So the I am sending my messenger, um, that might be a reference to the prophet himself, or it might be a reference to this other figure, uh, the book uh, that comes to be known. 
but is specifically a few verses later identified as Elijah. So it could be that you've got John the Baptist here in the role of Elijah. Elijah, he is the Elijah of his day, clearly fulfilling that promise. And he is preparing the way then for the return of the king, as we like to say, those of us who are Tol Tol uh, Tolkien uh, uh, lovers. I love it. And Is this baptism, Christopher, the same as Christian baptism? Jesus is baptized here. Yeah, Jesus is baptized here. This is not the same. And it's very helpful sometimes the biblical characters tell us the answers to the questions that we ask, if only we read what they say. And here John makes very clear what's going on. He's talking about this baptism uh, for confession of sin. And he makes the case that there is his baptism is a symbol. And for those of you who had to take uh, Lutheran confessions and know about the disputes about the sacraments, the fact that it's a symbol, it stands for something else. So he pours water on people as a sign of their confession, a symbol of their confession. But the water is just water. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything other than to mark that they have made a confession. But then John makes the point that there is a different kind of baptism coming, and it is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this, again, I think is a, is a nice distinction. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a symbol. It does something. It is God's action doing something. And so I think that uh, this is a good place to, to think about baptism because John lays it out so very clearly there. And so then uh, in uh, my, uh, my beloved teacher, Don Jules, uh, one of his favorite verses in the Bible, verse 10, it says, just as he was coming up out of the water, he, that is Jesus, we assume. Uh, yeah, it's actually it's unclear. It could be John, but. It could be John. It's probably but, Jesus. Yeah, the most, uh, as he was coming up the water, that's clearly Jesus he saw. Mm -hmm. But probably the spirit descending like a dove on him. Um, and then a voice from heaven. Again, the Old Testament is everywhere here. Quoting Psalm 2, you are my son. Psalm 2 is a. Uh, clearly messianic psalm mm -hmm. uh, and it was uh, it was trusted uh, to contain a messianic uh, word uh, you are my son again this is then a Christ this is a, a messianic claim with you i am well pleased and then so what jewel loved about it is the heavens are torn apart and at the end of the gospel mark we're going to get the curtain in front uh, in the temple uh, is torn also and the idea is that in Jesus Christ, something is fundamentally changed in terms of God's relationship with creation or creation's relationship to God. And that is that the spirit is now on the loose, as uh, Don used to uh, like to say, in a new way. I mean, the spirit has always pervaded creation. But I really think this is important. And you and I uh, have talked about this in other contexts. I would invite people to... Uh, perhaps dwell on this in a sermon. A Christian inhabits a, 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 a symbolic world that is different than a non-Christian. And the first thing about it is that it is a spirit inhabited world, as in the Holy Spirit, that the fundamental, most important thing about reality, according to a Christian worldview, is that the Holy Spirit is loose in the neighborhood, uh, doing the things that God wants it to do. And I think that choice of words, and I think Don Jewell picks up on this as well, is important when you say the Holy Spirit is loose, because this tearing is yep. different than an opening. So you'll see in Matthew and Luke, if we compare them in terms of what we call synoptic, we look at them alongside of each other, the heavens opens, and something that's opened can, of course, be closed again. But in Mark, it's torn apart in the same way the temple is torn apart or the temple curtain is torn. And so, again, it's this idea that the world has fundamentally changed with the arrival of Jesus and the Spirit. And I think that's something that, yeah, is good to keep in mind because we're going to come back to it at the end. It's something yeah. that we see throughout the Gospel of Mark. I want to point out two things here. Uh, I want to point to two different songs 
Uh, one song people will be familiar with, um, From a Distance, God is Watching Us. That's the God who stays behind the heavenly curtain and watches the creation from a distance. As opposed to Peter Mayer, uh, he, uh, Peter Mayer uh, was the, is the longtime guitar player in Jimmy Buffett's Coral Reefer Band, uh, and he's also a Christian. And he had heard uh, someone speak about this verse and talk about how God is on the loose. And he went and he wrote a song. Um, I think it's called God is Loose in the World. And so uh, uh, do yourselves a favor, pull it up on YouTube and listen to Peter Mayer, M-A-Y-E-R. Um, not to be confused, uh, there's two Peter Mayers. Uh, this is the one who played uh, uh, with Jimmy Buffett. And I really think um, this is a God who will, as God comes to us, brooks no compromise. Uh, it's a God who's in our face, uh, who won't stay at a distance, whose desire to be reconciled to each and every one of us is so profound that the heavens are torn. And rather than uh, the, the Spirit retreating back into heaven, verse 12, the Spirit then drives Jesus into the wilderness. And uh, again, there are no temptation scenes in Mark, uh, but he is rather in the wilderness, tempted by Satan. And then he comes out and he announces what I think is the theme verse for the Gospel of Mark. And I'm going to play with this. And uh, uh, in the next few weeks, the theme verse, Jesus then announces the good news. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has drawn near. And then how do we translate this, uh, Christopher? Repent and believe in the good news. Repent. In uh, the Hebrew word for repent means to turn around, turn back to God. But that's not what the Greek word means. So uh, tell us about this Greek word in verse fifteen. Yeah. So the Greek word in verse fifteen is metanoio, and this is related etymologically to your mind. But one of the things we learn when we take Greek is that you should never trust etymologies. And so there's yes. been a little bit too much, I think, because of that connection that's been made about this being a mental thing, as though it's about changing one's mental disposition. Because when we look at it in our literature, it means something very similar to what we think of as repentance in English. That is this uh, understanding that the way that you have been acting or the way that you have conducted yourself has hurt others and that there's a need for change in that. And so I think that that's an important uh, aspect of this. And I also think that there's uh, important to remember that this first chapter of Mark, as we've talked about, is suffused with this language from the Old Testament and from the prophets. And the prophets are full of instructions about repentance and what repentance means. And I think that is the first place we should look for the context of this, is these places where the prophets have called, again, over and over Israel to repent, to return to their God. And I think that this is um, will play itself out in a similar way in the Gospel of Mark. I, I do wonder if something like, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has drawn near, let your mind be blown. <laughs> and trust the good news. Uh, something like that I like to play with. I, 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 I agree with you, the etymological fallacy that words mean their etymologies. They don't. Um, but sometimes it's fun to play with them. Oh, very much so. And I think that's an important thing as you go through the Gospel of Mark, is the Gospel of Mark is so fascinating because in some ways it is the most mysterious of the Gospels. Jesus is going to play with and to challenge the way we think about his ministry and to challenge the way we think about the good news. And so playing with these translations and playing with these ways of thinking about topics like repentance, which you may think you know what it means, the Gospel of Mark is going to challenge that. And so I think that's a great invitation here at the beginning to uh, keep that openness in mind. We should say one word about the last story. This is a long opening passage in Mark, and that is Jesus then immediately calls disciples, Simon and Andrew and James, the son of Jebedee, Zebedee, <laughs> excuse me, and John. He, he calls them, 
and uh, and says, follow me and I will make you fish for people. The call here is to follow Jesus. And they don't know what this means uh, yet. We don't know what it means yet. Um, but I, I, I do think that um, in today's world, um, where post-enlightenment we have oftentimes reduced faith to intellectual belief that this that the idea that a christian is one who follows jesus is helpful to yeah very much so and you know my doctor father uh, stephen ahern kroll in talking about the gospel of mark sees this as another thematic verse that much of what we see in mark is mark laying out what it means and what it doesn't mean <laughs> to follow after Jesus. And we'll see this, this goes back to a, kind of a preview. Again, chapter eight, we'll come back to this language of what it means to follow Jesus. So I think that's a good start. <laughs>